Harvard historian and professor Elizabeth Hinton spoke at RCC regarding America's mass incarceration epidemic, a subject she tackles in her latest book titled, From the War on Poverty to the War on Crime, The Making of Mass Incarceration in America. In it, she explains how policy dating back to the 1960s has created the number one mass incarceration nation in the entire world. I got a chance to sit down with Professor Hinton to discuss the many factors that played into creating the incarceration environment we currently reside in, as well as the socioeconomic factors that encourage it. We also talked about her newest book, which the New York Times called a revelation. The book really demonstrates that for the past 50 years, ever since Lyndon Johnson declared the war on crime, national policymakers, state and local policymakers and officials have decided to respond to issues of unemployment, poverty, racial discrimination with more police, more surveillance and more incarceration. And this has really failed as a domestic policy path. And so we really need to rethink what our priorities are and how we're going to respond to the issues that the most isolated and marginalized citizens are confronted in this country. And obviously racism and migration and immigration really, really shapes um, inequalities in the U.S. Is that a matter of proper funding for certain infrastructure, tax reallocation, what is it? Yes, we have made the decision to prioritize building prisons, militarizing police forces, and divesting from social welfare programs and investing in various punitive programs. So part of it is, is redistributing the ways in which we spend taxpayer dollars. Um, and investing, deciding to invest in resources and institutions for people who have been systematically excluded from access to education, from access to jobs, particularly jobs outside of the service economy and things like that. So this is going to require us to reprioritize and rethink our budgets and how we, how we spend money and what really what kind of society do we want to build. We want to build a society where every single child has an opportunity to get a decent education and to and to live in a in a, in a home that um, that will provide them opportunities to be able to succeed instead of a place that's maybe infested with 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 insects and where water isn't running and things like that. And there are millions of American children living in these kind of extreme poverty conditions, which is, I think is unacceptable in a country um, that is a, as abundant as ours. But why do you think it's so taboo to invest in education? To invest in infrastructure for the middle class than it is to invest, like you said, on prisons or militarization and such? Well, I think that part of it is a real kind of resistance to what, what could be called a wealth redistribution and really um, using taxpayer dollars to help those at the that, that need it the most. I think that there's a, like a lot of people are very, there's a very kind of individ, individualistic approach instead of like a more collective approach to um, how to address social problems. And so we have really, policymakers have really privileged that founding principle of liberty over equality. And so there's a sense that if somebody else, you know, like this, this discourse around things like so-called welfare dependency, there's a sense that if if somebody else is having access to health care or having access to um, to to food to feed their families if they if they're if they're unable to provide from, for them as a single mother with kids that this is somehow taking out of opportunities for um, quote unquote hard uh, hard working Americans at the same time we've got all kinds of corporate welfare policies we have you know we have all kinds of kickbacks for for some of the richest people in this country and that somehow is tolerated I think another aspect of it is that poverty in this country is really individualized and pathologized so that it's not necessarily seen as a result of historical discrimination and the kind of systematic exclusion from access to resource and instead it's seen as kind of the result of individual um, behavior traits which is just not true um, whatsoever so part of it is is a question of the ways in which we understand the root causes of poverty to me it feels that racism is much easier and requires less thought than actually having a well-rounded opinion, a well-rounded approach to things on how to tackle issues. Mm -hmm. How can we 
change people's minds when the alternative is so much easier? I think part of it, I mean, you know, take incarceration as an example. We are such a divided and segregated society, um, not just by race, but also by class, by region. And I think it's really easy for people to kind of other the unknown, other entire groups of people who they don't know and to make, um, to stereotype them, to make, to kind of hold a set of assumptions about them that are really untrue and part of it has to do with the fact that people are so isolated and and divided and I think this election really really kind of opened up new discussions in that respect. What it took to bring about the abolition of slavery was kind of the decimation of slave narratives and really bringing newly free or bringing freed people or former slaves who had either escaped or um, had freed themselves into conversations and dialogue with other people and I think with the incarceration issue, and this is beginning to change, but people who are incarcerated or formerly incarcerated really need to begin to get their voices and stories out so that a lot of these, the, the kind of forces that led to, um, to criminal acts and incarceration are demystified for people so that people can see it within individual contexts and as part of a larger process rather than um, a kind of innate criminality, which I think is what a lot of people assume. So, so part of it is breaking barriers between groups that are really, really isolated from one another. So today, given the priorities of the Trump administration, when Black Lives Matter and Make America Great Again are two of the most prominent catchphrases in the nation, it's clear we've really reached this kind of breaking point. And I see the problems of policing and criminal justice at the center of this crossroads or breaking point. I think that it seems like Trump is really gearing, I mean, he's called um, his administration a law and order administration. That kind of direct rhetoric we haven't really heard since Nixon framed in that way, but I mean, similar discourse we get um, in Reagan. So we're, you know, he's preparing for a real clampdown. He's talked about reinstituting um, stop and frisk policies, reinstituting zero tolerance policies, which the leading criminologists, sociologists, and law enforcement authorities themselves know don't effectively control crime and don't keep officers safer. These policies don't work. What they do do is lead to more incarceration, greater drain on taxpayer dollars spent on incarcerating people. So it's much less expensive to educate people than it is to incarcerate them, yet we continue to embrace these policies. So I don't think that we can expect during Trump at the national level major um, criminal justice reform. I think he's probably gearing up to declare a war on gangs. He's talked a lot about this and and, and a war on immigrants. I think that these these policies are deeply linked linked, and essentially it amount it could amount to a rounding up of, of black and brown citizens, which is what we've seen for years. So it's up to us. I mean, I, I do think that we can remain positive and optimistic about the momentum that's been building for criminal justice reform, as long as we keep the pressure on um, policymakers at all levels of government. I think that we've seen really promising reforms even with the results of the national election at the state level, California has made major strides in the last two elections, most recently with Prop 57. Um, mind, edu- mind educating us what Prop 57 is? Yeah, so Prop 57 basically took the onus, it did a couple of things. It took the onus on, um, on off of prosecutors and onto judges to decide whether or not a juvenile should be tried as an adult. So this, in a sense, marks kind of a decarceration of, um, of kids who are committing crimes and being treated like they're adults when in fact they're children. And it also um, loosened parole requirements for nonviolent offenders. So it means that people who committed drug crimes or nonviolent crimes are, will be released from prison um, sooner. So it it does, it does begin to mark this kind of push towards decarceration. And I think we need to keep these policies going at the state level here in California and in in other states as well. Um, the, The resistance that we're seen on the part of local and state policymakers to some of Trump's proposed immigration reforms is also promising. So I think resisting at the policy level is key, but it's also in order to keep policymakers accountable, it's up to us to continue to protest around issues that we care deeply about, to continue to call and write our our, our local state and national representatives to let them know how we feel about these issues and the kind of policies that we want to see, even if they don't reflect what the Trump administration is projecting. It's, but it seems our culture mainly focuses, overall, our culture focuses on punishment and not necessarily reform. How can we shift the consciousness through education, um, 
So part of it is the way that we define public safety and prevention. I mean, maybe, you know, the and this is kind of Trump's policy. He sees the most effective way to to kind of put forth a crime control policy by, you know, putting more police on the streets, continuing the, this kind of like zero tolerance policy where citizens are arrested for misdemeanors or what amounts to meaningless crimes from panhandling to graffiti to all sorts of things. Um, and of course, th this kind of law enforcement is happening in targeted neighborhoods usually happens in low-income black and Latino communities. And so part of it is like rethinking what we mean by crime control. Crime control can mean a major jobs program. Crime control can mean investing instead of in punishment in real rehabilitation. It can mean providing um, newly released people with a concrete means to really have a second chance at life. That includes not just job training programs, but real job programs with educational opportunities. We can begin to invest in our social welfare infrastructure as a crime prevention and crime control measure, rather than kind of responding with punitive force. Again, these are the policies that have really been embraced at all levels of government for the last half century, and they have not worked. Instead, we have ended up with the largest prison population on the planet. Giovanni Alcibia, reporting for Viewpoints.